Let me know when you're rolling. I'm rolling. My name is Morley and I am a Los Angeles based Things in life up in your face to taste. Throw your hands up. A lot of people have different uh, definitions of what a street artist is. For me, I feel like a street artist can be anyone who's creating and expressing something visual in a public forum, generally without permission. The thing that I do is wheat paste, which is essentially wallpapering posters around the city. My posters are primarily text-based, uh, sort of messages that I'm trying to offer the city and pieces of encouragement, hope, and humor. To me, I'm fascinated by the texture of the street. Growing up, I was always frustrated by the fact that when I would go to a museum, I wanted to touch the paintings. I wanted to feel the brush strokes. I wanted to, to feel the texture of the paint on the canvas. That would make me feel like Van Gogh was a real person. You know what I mean? Those velvet ropes kind of felt like it kept me from having a real relationship with the artist. And that's one of the things that I love about street art is the fact that someone could walk up to something I've done and touch it and feel the texture of the wood underneath it. The fact that there is something tactile about it, it removes those boundaries, it removes that velvet rope and that security guard saying, no photos. <laughs> Obviously I take great detail with my sketches when I'm preparing a piece. I grew up in Iowa City, Iowa, which is a, a city in Iowa. Growing up, I spent a fair amount of time by myself. My parents got divorced when I was pretty young. I moved around somewhat before we settled in Iowa. Okay, hey, got any questions to ask me? My best friend was my imagination, so naturally that lent itself to being interested in storytelling, specifically screenwriting. This scene is from Crazy Psycho Lady 3. Living in Iowa, I always felt kind of um, caged a little bit. I always felt like, oh, there's some amazing life that's living just outside this, this town in the Midwest. And for me, it was New York. And once I get to New York, everything's going to change. I'll feel confident and comfortable in my skin. I'll get to use what talents I have to, to share with the world. And they'll all clap and say, you know, finally, you've arrived. I moved to New York City in 2000 to attend the School of Visual Arts. Upon arriving in New York, I discovered, oh, 
I don't immediately just become confident and you know comfortable in my own skin. I'm just one of many people there. And there's nothing uniquely special about me, per se. And so that sort of threw my whole world up into upheaval. And for me, a big important part of solving that crisis was investing in a faith that I could understand what has true value in this world. The idea of hope not lying in success or lying in an identity that's defined by people telling you you're special. It can be defined in a way that you have more control over. You can say, I'm choosing to define myself through a faith that says I'm good the way that I am. I want to offer people the sense that it's not after we, you know, fix ourselves that we have value, that there's value even in the broken. And then the second thing that happened to me when I moved to New York was I discovered street art. One, two, uh. Growing up in Iowa, I hadn't really been exposed to street art. My exposure was kind of limited to curse words carved into bathroom stall doors. And uh, so when I moved to New York, I started seeing all of this art that was created specifically with the goal of existing in the, in the world. There wasn't this agenda beyond that. There wasn't a sense of like, you know, come see my band play. The art was the band playing. As a person who was an aspiring screenwriter, I was always sort of making blueprints for buildings that never got built. What I did was I started silk screening messages onto contact paper, which is like that stuff that you line kitchen shelves with and stuff, and I would stick it up around the subways of New York. It started with, with just kind of creating something out of sheer frustration. Of, I just, I need to express myself. It was like a release valve. I'm creating something that somebody is seeing and that is at least enough for right now. I moved to Los Angeles around 2006, and again, I was sort of confronted by living in a city full of creative people all chasing the same dream, except that outside of the safe womb of art school, I was seeing more people that had been chasing it for decades and not succeeding. There was a lot of people that I wanted to offer encouragement to, and one of those people was myself. I was like, Okay, if I'm walking down the street, what's a message that would be important to me? What's a message that would make me feel like there's some hope? Here, everybody drives cars. It's a car culture out in Los Angeles. So I realized I needed to create art that would be visible when you're driving 35 miles an hour down the street. Something that you could see quickly, ingest, and hopefully appreciate. I sort of upgraded from stickers to these wheat pasted posters. And I wanted to add something to it. When I first started creating these stickers, it was just the messages. But I realized that I wanted these messages to be coming from a person. I didn't want them to come from a logo or a brand. So I started drawing myself into these posters. It really wasn't something that I had thought about that much. I didn't think that someone would say, oh, it's very narcissistic in some way. I just wanted the messages to be coming from, from a friend. I feel like we're all just kind of wounded people who are just doing what we can to kind of stay positive and keep a smile on our face until the world kicks us in the balls again. <laughs> and then I think in some way, we're all kind of looking to be healed, um, looking for, or for someone or something to, to heal us. Uh, and um, I, I don't think Morley with his work uh, professes to do that. He doesn't know how to fix people. He doesn't know the answer. But at the very least, um, he tells you that it's okay to feel that way and that he's been there too and that we'll get through this together and um, in, a, in a crowded lonely town uh, I always feel like I have a friend 
when I see Morley's work on the street. And I also love that in so many of your pieces, you know, the works are still in progress. The works right. themselves are still works in progress. You're finishing up a letter or right. you're, you're touching something up. The nature of a lot of these things being sort of like desperate pleas in a way, to me, I thought it further the idea that like this is like the instant that the person's walking by is the instant that this piece was just like the last letter sort of being filled in or something. There's, a, like there's that. an immediacy to it. Exactly. So that someone would walk by it and it wouldn't feel like something that had like a monument that had existed for years and years, like a beautiful statue or it something. It becomes less like presentational. Exactly. And more like just for you at the second. I'm so glad exactly. you came by. And yeah. the truth is, it's probably going to be gone in a day or two anyway, <laughs> right. so it makes sense even more, you know? <laughs> For me, the important aspects of embracing one's imperfections led me to pick the name Morley, which is my middle name. Growing up, I was always really uh, embarrassed of it. It always felt sort of dorky and old-fashioned. But as I was kind of building what I wanted my art to look like, I realized I'm sort of dorky and old-fashioned. So instead of being embarrassed of it, I could wear it as a badge of honor. I've always fantasized about if I could write letters to my younger self, if I could warn my younger self, if I could, you know, encourage my younger self. I thought, uh, what if I could do this in kind of a metaphorical way by creating a wall where people could write messages to their younger selves? I wrote Be Kind because I think people need to be kind to themselves a lot more, especially growing up. And I look back at myself in high school and middle school, and if I had been a little kinder to myself, things would have gone a lot better. I wrote You Don't Need Permission. I put on the wall Don't Overthink. Ganbate, which is good luck, because you'll need it. <laughs> I wrote, you're beautiful without makeup. I, I'm 25 and I wear makeup every single day, and I hate leaving the house without it. And I've been told a million times over by my family, by my friends, that I look better without it, but like, I still believe that I need to put on a mask every day. So, no, <laughs> sorry, we're super <laughs> If a person can relate to something that somebody else wrote, if a person can uh, can take that wisdom and say, wow, that's, that's actually something that applies to me now, I would consider this a success. A lot of my art starts with me sitting in the car. I think about the things I'm going through. I think about the things my friends and family are going through. I think about the thing that could be happening in the car next to me. I think about the homeless person I'm driving past. I think about the woman sitting on the bus that's heading to her job that she's frustrated to have but is happy to be paying the bills. All of those things inform my thoughts as I'm sitting and coming up with an idea. The first thing that kind of occurs to me is the sentiment. Then I start trying to boil it down to its most essential elements. I feel most proud of the piece that I can create where I have a complex idea that's expressed in as simplified way as possible. Then I start the drawing of me. I scan it and I incorporate that into a, a Photoshop document that has a, a font that I created. I then print it out. Back in the day, I used to go to Kinko's to print them out, um, but then the, they switched printers and so I had, to, I had to invest into one of these obscenely large printers. Then I drive around. Sometimes I have a spot that I've found and thought, oh, this would be good for this kind of message, but most of the time I'm just driving around and looking for some place. I find a good spot. I put a layer of paste up, put the poster up, and then I put another layer of paste up to seal it in, and then I take off. Oftentimes when I'm creating art and putting it up, I do it during the middle of the day because during the middle of the day, people assume, oh, he must have permission. He must be doing this to advertise something, and he's with some big company, and they're paying him to put these posters up. If you act with authority, people will oftentimes just assign it to you. Los Angeles is an amazing city, and one of the aspects of it that I find really intriguing is that there's a lot of tribes. It, it created a lot of different contexts for the messages. I wouldn't create a message about materialism in Compton, and I wouldn't create a message about pushing through adversity in Beverly Hills. But the fact that I can drive from one of those places to the other in an afternoon and create art for those environments and the people and the culture that's in that environment was really amazing because it allowed me to speak to a lot of different people. The artwork that I create, I leave a lot of the DNA for people to fill in. 
If it's 10 words on a poster, that requires the person that's passing it to sort of implant their own experiences into it and say, this is why this has significance to me or why this has any kind of relatability to me. But if they can take their struggles and they can say, this poster speaks to these struggles, then I think there's value in that. There, there are definitely things within creating street art that have they've put me in interesting positions. Whether that's taking a tumble, or um, getting yelled at by a random person on the street, I watch you. Or I'm a homeless person. Sorry. Hey, dude, don't be kidding me. I wasn't trying to I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Or misjudging the depth of the Los Angeles River when creating a piece. Yeah, it's uh it's pretty cold. Pretty cold, but uh <laughs> worth it. <laughs> Worth, worth it. What I do is not legal, but I see it as a sort of public service. Um, you know, there are a lot of people that take issue with the legality of what I do. I never wanted someone to see something that I did and think, oh, that's a positive message, but it's expressed in a destructive way. So the spots that I look for are those electrical boxes, temporary construction walls and boarded up buildings. And you can paste something up on a boarded up wall and then as soon as the building is sold, they take the boards down and no damage has been done. For me, I think it is possible to create art that isn't doing a lot of property damage, but is still using the public space in a way that again is beneficial to the community. I have not yet been arrested uh, I've been stopped a number of times by police officers. Because I can pull my poster off of whatever I'm pasting on, they usually let me go with a lecture. But I have been handcuffed at times, and, and uh, you know, they've run my record and things like that. I think all street artists have to sort of come to terms with, is this worth getting arrested for? Is this message that I'm putting out there something that is potentially something that I could get in real trouble for? And so for me, it was really important to create art that would be positive and would be a message that I would stand behind if I was getting handcuffed while creating it, you know? This is my space too, and I'm going to use it for something other than an advertisement. Every square inch of an eye line has some billboard expectorated across it. For me, I thought, what if I utilized a lot of the same techniques that they do? But what if my posters didn't have the agenda of selling you something? What if they were offering something for free? I think we can take that space back a little bit. As much as I would love to take 100% full credit for any time uh, a message has reached someone in a, in a profound way. There is a magic in street art that doesn't exist in a gallery. It's all about miraculous timing. There are going to be people that walk by a poster of mine and say like, oh, it doesn't mean anything to me. But there's going to be a few people, hopefully, that will walk by and be like, how did they know? How did they know that that was for me right now in this moment? I have no idea who's going to walk by something I've done. And it's really up to God or the universe or whatever you want to believe to sort of position it so that that person is walking by the day that that poster exists rather than the next day after it's been painted over or torn down or covered up with an advertisement. You don't get that as much in a gallery. A gallery is like a band playing at a venue and a piece of street art is like a guy playing a guitar in a subway stairwell. There's an intimacy to that that I think gives my work meaning.
The last few years, there's been some challenges for me that you know aren't necessarily abnormal to any person that's my age. My dad was diagnosed with stage four esophageal cancer. My wife and I suffered a miscarriage. I wanted my, my artwork to reflect all the different seasons of life. In my 20s, I feel like the message that I kind of kept trying to hammer home was never, ever, ever give up. As the years have progressed, I've realized the sort of insufficiency of just the notion of just don't give up, just keep chasing it, just keep chasing it, because sometimes things happen that you can't control. No matter how much you want them, sometimes it falls apart in your hands. I don't feel like we are equipping people in this culture with the ability to experience loss and defeat I think that to me is something that I hope my artwork can articulate to whatever degree I'm able to. Life is, is all of it. It's the triumph and the tragedy. It's not enough to just say don't give up. Sometimes we need to experience that defeat and see what that teaches us and who we are on the other side of that. After I've come up with a, a message, I generally run it by my wife because I want another perspective, but also I want to make sure that the message is getting across the way I had intended it to. She's encouraging, but never afraid to say, I don't think that you're achieving what your goal is for this. It's rare that I have anybody help me uh, put my art up because of the legal nature of it. I never wanted to put anybody else at risk. But from time to time, I will get an assist from my wife uh, just when I need like another set of hands to create a piece of art. So here's the head. Oh, he's low. Oh my gosh, good. Just to give a sense of it, the diameter of the baby's head. You have to dilate to 10 centimeters. That's because the fattest part of the baby is the head. Oh Yours is 7.3, which is fine. So you're three quarters of the way cooked. <laughs> Here's wow. the heartbeat. Sounds wonderful. Last fall, my wife and I discovered that we are expecting a little boy. And that is currently the adventure that we're hurtling <laughs> at breakneck speed towards. I think that becoming a dad, it's gonna be interesting how it affects my art. I get the feeling that I'm gonna be learning a lot more lessons, humbling and otherwise. I hope that my ideas of the world keep changing and, and, and evolving, hopefully becoming more nuanced. And if I run out of ideas and I'm just like, yep, the gas tank's empty, then maybe I would hang up my spurs and hand it on to my son, say, hey, what can you tell the world? Where are we going? We are going to the hospital.
you know, maybe the question isn't so much how my art will change now that I'm a father, as much as, you know, whether my art was kind of practice for me being a father. You know, the messages and the ideas that I have in my art, you know, hopefully there'll be some kind of a first draft or something for, uh, for the lessons that I want to impart to him. It's been such a strange ride for me. I never thought that my work would be more than a hobby. I spent so much of my life planning a destiny, and this is not how it looked. It's freeing because your destiny isn't you know, shackled to your expectations, but it's also terrifying because who knows where this will go. Success to me, um, I don't know. Just the ability to continue being a part of that magical experience of putting something somewhere, knowing that it's not gonna be there forever, having someone walk by it and feel a relationship with the piece of art that they've stumbled over. I think sometimes I'm a success and sometimes I've reached that success. Not always. I mean, I, I, I couldn't know. I wouldn't know if I was that, if I, if I ever reached that success, which is comforting in its own way because that means I can never know if I'm a failure. If I never know that I'm a success, then I never know that I've failed. So maybe success isn't about achieving anything. Maybe success is about feeling empowered by the potential that maybe I've made a difference. I don't know. I think that potential is, that potential is all I could ever want.